Hey, Tourpreneurs, it's Mitch Bach. And just a quick note before we begin today's episode, Tourpreneur is currently sponsored by Google. We're thankful for their support of our community, and we are offering with them a completely free course helping you unlock the power and potential of Google's Things to Do program, which is specifically helping tour operators add their tours to Google in new ways that gives you new exposure and more direct bookings. To learn more, go to tourpreneur.com slash Google. And as always, show notes, more resources, links to our newsletter, our business coaching community, and so much more are available on tourpreneur.com. Now to the episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of the Tourpreneur podcast. I'm Mitch Bach. I'm here with Peter Simon, Chris Torres, my fellow wise men, as we've been called, or amigos, and also with Bruce Rossard and Douglas Quinby, the COO and the COO of the famous, maybe infamous Arrival Tour Operator event. And uh, today's topic is the beginning of a series of episodes that has been long asked for in our community. How do you know which event to attend in our strange and fragmented and wide and diverse industry. We've got buyer-seller conferences, trade conferences, education events, networking events, events that are 100,000 people, events that are 100 people. So where is the ROI for you as an experienced operator? And how do you know which event is going to deliver that ROI? And finally, how do you prepare for these conferences to get the most out of them? Welcome, Douglas. Welcome, Bruce. Great to have you here. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Great Peter Portner show. Oh, I'm going to say hello too, right? Um, great to be on this show. It's been a, been a long time. Love doing it with you guys, and we appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> Permission granted, Bruce. Peter, I think you probably been in this industry the longest and known Douglas and Bruce the longest. So where do we begin in deciphering this strange topic of which event do I attend when there's so many of them out there? Yeah. You wouldn't be surprised to say that I've got a process uh, for events, especially for operators who are maybe in a little bit inexperienced and not done many events or thinking about events. I think it's a learning process that they have to go through. And if you jump right in at the big events, like if you go to WTM or ITB as your first event, it's going to be a bit overbearing and not, you're probably going to burn some cash and not get a huge amount of value. So in every single operator's destination, there's lots of small local events, right? Run by local associations, local DMOs, local networking groups, all sorts. Some of them 100% focused on tourism in the destination. Some of them focused on small business in the destination. I think you cut your teeth by going to small local events. And then once you get into the into the process of networking, doing deals, making connections, and opening up partnerships in your own locality, I think it gives you the process and the mindset then to start looking out at bigger events. And I would class arrival is not a massive event, but it's in the middle, it's in the middle level, and it's very, very, very focused on tours and activities and, and attractions. So arrivals maybe not in the instant event if you're a brand new operator go and cut your teeth locally then start going to the bigger ones and also make sure you understand what the event is because as we know there's buyer seller events there's education events that focus on networking and education i don't make the mistake going to an education event thinking you're coming away with a lot of buyers that's just not going to happen uh, and the other thing is to appreciate the amount of work that you have to do pre-event and post-event the work, the hey, actual hey, event. Just, just on that though, can I like, so explain what a buyer is. I think that's especially for new operators because that's a, a loaded term. Uh, how, how do you define a buyer and how should uh, your, your listeners think about, okay, what is a buyer and how to segment them and how to think about that in the context of events and how to source them? Sure. Sure. So again, there's different events. There's events where the general public go to and where you can be selling B to C direct to general public. And where they're looking at inspiration, the dreaming phase, they've wandered in looking normally for quite big ticket 
multi-day stuff. But I've never really had, I've had some success doing that in the past, but the real success comes when you're doing B2B, finding partners who are distributors, and whether they're online distributors, whether they're other tour operators, where you're working on a B2B channel, building up a distribution channel, and that's where the work comes in, because that is six weeks before the event, looking at who's attending, reaching out, setting up meetings, having 10, 15 minutes at the event, setting up the following meeting that's going to be followed up by the, the phone call after the meeting. So I'm a big fan of events from B to B. I've not been particularly successful at events in B to C. But even like, you know, within that universe of, of events and just like the, the term buyer, I, so I just think it's, you know, it's super interesting because, uh, so like, for example, at, at, um, you know, at Arrival, we definitely have that buyer-seller dynamic. And uh, for us, you know, we really lean into the digital side. So we have, you know, most, if not all of the online travel agencies, for example, big and small, as well as some bigger, you know, B2B uh, distributors, organizations like hotel beds or others. But uh, what we don't have at Arrival is uh, a lot of, uh, say, smaller kind of travel agency groups or smaller buyers or other, say, smaller tour operators that might be buying from local in-destination operators. And there are so many events. So, for example, if you're a, you know, if you're a luxury, uh, you know, tour experience provider, you really want to go after that luxury international traveler, you know, events like, like so like the Virtuoso Travel Agency Network, which is one of the largest luxury groups. And they have what is their big show is like, is it Virtuoso World or something? But it's like this big event. I think they hold it in Vegas over Las here. Vegas. Yeah. But that's like a great place. So if you're really going after that affluent traveler, like that's an organization to go after. Um, but there's lots of like travel agent groups where that hold events for their travel agents. And that's an opportunity for tour operators to, to go there and kind of sell into their agency group. It's, yeah, there's... A uh, big question too is what kind of buyers are you looking for? Who your audience is? And sorry, I'm I'm. Uh, you guys should be telling your audience this. So, no, this is this is good. Finally, we have three moderators for one Peter sign. I think <laughs> finally. <laughs> Bruce, Bruce, can you break this down for me? You've been running and operating events for a long time. In terms of from this perspective of the operator, what? kind of food groups are there of events out there and and what what's on what's on the menu yeah no um well i think a magic word that peter uses roi and roi is going to be different for everybody so it's hard to be general like this these are the events to go to right so if you have to start with what your objectives are as you guys said you know how new are you are you brand new torpreneur just getting into the business well then you're probably you know it's gonna be hard for you to justify spending a thousand or two thousand or more you know with the travel and everything going to an event um but is it and the reason i say that is to me there's a real difference you know especially at this tourpreneur level of our business of a hobbyist and someone who is new but really wants to get into this business right so if you're a hobbyist yeah don't spend the money coming to events it might be hard to get a true roi but if you really want to get into the business and be a professional at this business, then events is a great way to network with people, network with other, uh, whether they're entrepreneurs or bigger in, uh, companies in the industry that are more than willing to share what they know. One good connection could be an ROI. Literally, like I think you all agree with that, right? I mean, if you meet, and I don't mean just find the right distributor if you're a, a, you know, a small operator, I mean one person can be the right ROI for you. And if it's a two, three or four day event um, and you do your homework, like Peter says, and that is a definite thing that most people don't get on their first event is you got to do your homework. What is doing your homework? Every event has a mobile app. Get into that mobile app as soon as it's available and look at who's coming and decide who you want to meet with and schedule meetings. And you'll, I think, be surprised at how easy it is to schedule meetings, even with some of the company brands that you know, you don't think they'll take your meeting. Um, and then, you know, work, you know, stay out with Chris and Peter all night long and do the networking till two or three in the morning, which, you know, we're all famous at doing once in a while. The business is had at the bar after midnight, and I'm not just saying this because it's all of us on the phone or on the podcast, 
is is a lot, right? I mean, we've all done business. So that that's my my initial thing. Now, as far as the types of events, like Peter said, local, 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 absolutely everyone has local. But let's talk big events like ITB, WTM, Fitur, IPW. I mean, those events are overwhelming for a first timer. Um, you could definitely jump in, but you better have some experience in the industry or you will get overwhelmed. I mean, at WTM, there's like 30,000 people. At ITB, they're going to have 60,000 or so this year. At Fitur, there's like 70 or 80,000 people. Um, you know, like you said, we're in the middle at Arrival where we'll have, depending on the event, in the ballpark of 1,000 people at each event. But that's still a lot bigger than your local you know, DMO event that might only have a hundred or 200 people that are part of your community. Um, so you got to really evaluate. And I want to say one more thing. There's also a lot of events that are, you know, so at arrival, we're focused on the whole ecosystem of tours, activities, attractions, experiences. There are some and many events that are focused just on uh, kayak tours, right? There's kayak associations. There's some that are just focused on uh, PSAV, whatever that stands for, but you know, vessels that are traveling, you know, from island to island, et cetera. There's many different sub events. There's food tour events, et cetera. Um, so you got to really decide which ones are most relevant to where you are in your business today uh, and always be looking at ROI. Um, and, you know, I have always gotten ROI at every event I've ever attended. And, you know, that's probably over a hundred by now. Um, so there you go. Yeah, I, I can't emphasize enough about doing the groundwork up front, especially for, for those who are maybe new to events, because we've all been there you know, when we first start out, we first go to a networking event, they're a little bit nervous to go up to people and talk to them, and you feel as if you're intruding in a group of people who are talking, and a lot of people are like that, so at least if you do the groundwork ahead of time, you're making contact with people, you're sparking up those conversations, then when you get there, you've already made that connection, it's like meeting a friend, so you, you don't have that nervousness that you may have going to your first networking event, so contacting people before the event is whether they're new, new to or established is so underrated and many people don't do it and they really need to. So. But yeah, something too uh, that's really important, Chris, is this industry is a bit special. Uh, so having been, you know, working in, in the tourism industry in general for, I guess, uh, yeah, more than, more than two decades now, but in earlier times in my career where I was in, uh, I worked for a group that we kind of serve the entirety of the travel industry. And so I'd be going to like a hotel industry event that I'd be going to an aviation event or, and there's definitely a different vibe. Like, I, you know, you go to, uh, you know, an event of hotel franchise owners or, you know, or hotel revenue managers or, you know, aviation, you know, yield management specialists. And like, it's a different dynamic. And I, I never felt, um, uh, it, it never felt uh, like welcome or open. Whereas I, I feel in this industry and in tours and experiences in particular, like there is a fundamental cultural difference, which is, and I, I think the difference is this, like you've got like in other industries where people are attending events, there's a professional development component, but it's really about advancing yourself or advancing your company. In this industry, yes, that's the case, but the people who are, for the most part, you know, in this industry, I mean, there's a reason, look, there's a reason you guys aren't bankers. There's a reason you guys aren't like, you know, working in Wall Street or like it's like there's also there's a passion to this, to what you do and to connecting with other people and delivering amazing experiences or working with people who provide those experiences. So I've just, I mean, since day one, when I started engaging in this industry, you'd walk into a room and it's like, oh, welcome. How are you? Have a beer. Let's talk. Like I've, I've never in my, whereas I have been brushed off in other parts of travel more times than I care to remember in, in this part of travel. That's also one of the reasons we call it the best part of travel. Everyone I speak to, it's always like open arms. Welcome to the conversation. Who are you? Let's talk. That's, and this is a wonderful thing. So, uh, for, for everyone who's listening and especially if you're new to events, any nervousness or if you're an introvert, just remember you're in the experiences industry and with people who who are all about just being with people and making people feel great. So just be confident and go introduce yourself and have a great time. Let me add one other thing to that super quick. I know you want to speak, Peter. So 
let me just cut in there one one second with a, with an example. I uh, have gone to an event called the Mountain Travel Symposium, first as a client and then as a partner and, and done a lot with them. It's an event very much like Arrival. It's about a thousand people. Everyone at the event is there for the ski industry. It's the only reason they're there. And that's what I meant. There's a lot of different subsets of the attractions, tour activity attraction side. Um, they also have that same feeling that Douglas is talking about. They love to do business together and they have that exchange where for two days, 15 minute speed dating meetings, that's what they do for two full days. And they go ski with each other. They're out at night partying with each other. So it is one of those events and there's many of those that are specific segments um, that do have a, a culture around them and a community around them. And I think that's really important. And you know, if you have, if you're part of a subset of the best part of travel, then I would seek out those kinds of smaller events. I do think it's, especially with the tourpreneur community and most of the operators are reasonably small. Uh, the focus is a lot on the ROI that Bruce brought up earlier. People are really, in, in today's society, everything's so fast, everything's moving at 100 miles an hour, so everybody has high expectations of instant returns on everything. And you just got to accept that events are a marathon, right? The work you put in this year right, can be not paying back to the following year, but the big thing is it can pay back year after year after year after year after year. If you end up going to a buyer-seller conference and you pick up a partner, that partner can be with you 10, 15, 20 years, giving you business, and your cost to acquisition was 20 years ago. Then it's been laid off over the 20 years. So the re return on investment, people look at the ticket prices, and it is a lot of money. Again, when you take in the travel and stuff, I spent half my life at events, so I know the price of the thing. It is a lot of money. But we would be all off our head if we were doing this, if we weren't getting a return. When you look at the return over the 5, 10, 15 year period, as Bruce mentioned, if you're serious about being a tour operator, being serious about being a professional and building up a, a reasonable operation, I don't actually think there is a better ROI than partnerships that you're going to meet by face-to-face -face stuff at, at events. I think when uh, you were speaking, Douglas, the word that stood out was passion, that we enter this from so many different perspectives and life experiences. You don't go to accounting school and then attend accounting conferences and get, you know, your 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 brown suit uh, ready for it. <laughs> Absolutely. They do until they become tour operators. And then they throw that suit away, they buy a pirate ship, and then they say, what the heck am I going to do? Hey, I just have a question for each of you. When was the last time any of you bought a suit, let alone a brown suit? I mean, <laughs> I have not bought a suit 15 years, and that's and I'm proud proud of it. So, Chris had to buy a swimsuit. He's sitting next to a <laughs> right now in Carlos. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> So one other but, thing, like, oh, let's, let's go to this level too. You know, we talk about prep and how important prep is. You know, even if you just find 10 or 20 people you really want to meet, and you literally stalk them until you meet them. Then there's the post event work. Like I come home from a meeting and I've got all these scribble notes of the 20 or 30 people I met at an event or a conference. Then you got to follow up because if you don't follow up, that ROI goes away also. So you got to keep that as part of the process here of, oh, I met these people. I have notes about what I want to talk to them about. Follow up. Talk to them about it. That's also a big part of going to events. Bruce, you, you interrupted me complimenting Arrival. I was going to oh, say, <laughs> I know, I know. Um, but my, my point with this passion, with this passion point is that we enter with a lot of passion and a lot of excitement, but not necessarily with business acumen, with the knowledge of what we don't even know yet. And I think one of the biggest components that I think it's so valuable with what Arrival does is the education component, because you get there and I've met, I've met them because I'm also in education. I've met so many operators in the early stages of their business that come to Arrival and their eyes are open to everything they didn't understand about what they needed. They thought, you come up with the walking tour and you go out and you sell it, whatever that means to their brain. And then you are helping to professionalize the industry by showing them that they need booking software. They might need connectivity partners. They need um, development of the product level of business. They need a business strategy. All of that is 
somewhat unique to what we do versus accounting school or anything else where you come trained and understanding the industry. And I'm, I'm wondering if um, on this question of preparation to kind of bring it together, uh, all of you can answer this. How, how, how do you decide what you want out of it? Is education enough? Is, is, is it, how do you know in advance the kind of partner that you need? There's certainly an element of serendipity, but how do you plan in advance, not exactly knowing what you don't know yet? Yeah, I mean, obviously it depends on what you do, what your vertical is, what your niche is. You know, I spend a lot of time in adventure. So if I was going to an adventure travel conference and I'm interested in increasing my multi-day, so I'm looking for resellers that can sell my multi-day. Or I may be looking at, I may be a buyer and a seller, and I often was. So I'm looking resellers for my own products, but I'm looking for suppliers to buy in on my multi-day as well. So what who ones would I pick if there's 150 there? Who am I going to pick? Who am I going to reach out to? Who am I going to sit down with? Everybody should have a plan for their business. I'm in three countries. I want to be in four countries. So who is there from the fourth country that I want to enter? Because I'm not going to go there and spend, I've only got two days at the event and there's all these guys there from Peru, but I don't want to open up Peru. But there's two guys there for Colombia. I'm going to want to spend as much time as possible with them two guys for Colombia because that's where I want to, I want to get open up. I don't just want to have the meeting and because you're only going to get 15, 20 minutes if it's a busy event. I don't just want to get them, have the meeting there. I want to get it diaried. I want to get the follow-up. And essentially, if I'm super serious about opening that relationship after the meeting, I want to get them that evening after the meeting as well. Whether that's for dinner, whether it's for a snack, whether it's for a beer, you want as much contact at the event. For this. You're not going to sign up 15, 20 people and at buy, sell event. Have a real narrow focus that you want to get. If you walk away with one contract that lasts you 20 years, you're happy. But you can walk away with many contracts. We have a member entrepreneur, it was at WTM. WTM was crazy this year. Everybody did really well. He walked away with over half a million pounds worth of business with WTM for multiple contracts. There's a real difference between walking away with a contract, which is a little old school, Peter, I think you'll admit, of the old trade shows. It was like, Buyer or seller oh, across the table. Here's your contract. What's that? <laughs> well, well, we'll we'll go back. That's because I'm old. This business longer. <laughs> I've been doing buy sell uh, for a long, long time too. And it was in the old days where I was pre-internet. Here's your contract for the year. Thank you very much. Now I have to load it in my system, and that's our contract for the year. That was contracting at events. That doesn't really happen anymore. My contract is ongoing. Right as a as a partner between a distributor, okay, I'll pay you twenty percent commission or whatever it is. That's our deal. So that contract come ending with the contract is a little different than it was when the buyer seller was contract here. Thank you very much. Let's move forward. So it is about that quality time, like you were talking about, and making sure you connect with the right distributors, operators, whoever, and get that right uh, you know personal relationship in place, and then the contract will come. Yeah, from 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 our, from our side of, of you, you know, I'm I'm obviously coming to it from the from the supplier side. So I'm, I'm obviously I'm a marketing marketing agency. So my my take on this is a little bit different. You know, when I'm looking at the operators that I maybe want to work with, I'm going through the list of who I should need help. You know, for example, you know, it's like maybe they don't have great websites, or maybe I've been looking through all their social media channels and everything else to see how well I feel that they're doing on that. But any time I go to an event, I never ever sell to them. I go to them, I find out their pain points. I have basically a conversation with them saying, okay, where are you stuck in your journey of trying to grow your business? Where are you, where's the, where's the pain points for that you would like to solve? And at the end of it, if they ask me, okay, I'd love to see your packages or whatever that would be, then we'll have that discussion. But I'm always going there not to sell. I'm going there to find out more. And it helps me as well find out the pain points from different operators because that then gives me and to entrepreneur and everyone else to get create content to help them as well. So it's always asking, not never really going there for the sale from my perspective. It's always asking the pain points to find out what help they need, and that will then set you up. And it gives you more, it gives them more confidence in you further down the line. I think there's a thing where, again, for the operators, are not overly confident. It's all a bit new. You are going to have, unless you're right at the very beginning of the journey, if you've been around for a year or two years, you're going to have some contacts. You've got online contacts, especially because you've all been locked down for the last couple of years. 
reach out to people who are already in the industry, reach out to people who are connected and just have a chat with them before events. And if you're looking at the list and you're thinking about going, but you're not committed to going, have a look at who's going or asking your communities who is going and then reach out and just have 10, 15 minutes on the phone with someone that's going, right? just to talk through. A person may make introductions for you if you're a little bit nervous doing your own introductions. And if the, an experienced person in the industry will give you 15 minutes, half an hour, and make connections for you or just guide you on the right way. And we're all in communities. We're all in networks. Use the people that's in there to help guide you through these events to get the best return you can. Here, here's a great example. Um, on Tourpreneur, before our San Diego event, um, and I think this was before you guys took over, before before San Diego, right? Um, Brian Kane uh, put a post out saying, hey guys, should I go to Arrival or not? Um, Brian Kane at the time owned Crawl New Orleans, um, fairly new operator. And he put that question out to the Tourpreneur community and got a lot of positive response. So Brian Kane showed up at Torpreneur, uh, excuse me, at Arrival. And I spent some time with him. It was great to meet Brian. Now he is also uh, in Nashville and Austin. So he's obviously expanded since being a small Torpreneur, um, whether it came from connections and people he met at Arrival or not, I don't know. But I do know that he went a long way from that one meeting. that He used the Torpreneur community to talk to, should I come to this event or not? Um, and, and why, or why not? Um, and so like you said, Peter, you know, use the connections you have, use the networks you have, ask relevant questions that will help you decide which events to go to. I don't think Brian's announced, um, Austin yet. So you heard it here first on tourpreneur, um, bringing news. Cool. Well, <laughs> I just wanted to see where he is now. And so I can get a different search and Austin. No, I just joked. So, uh, Brian, let us No, it says owner full-time crawl Austin. I just driven you, Bruce. I just saw him in Austin a couple of days ago. <laughs> oh, um, Douglas, what about these giant behemoths? Uh, I'm thinking the trade shows like New York Times Travel Show, which I don't think exists anymore, and the Travel and Adventure shows, these giant places with 100,000 consumers coming into these football stadium-sized event spaces. Should Should an operator be looking at the DMO booths or the kinds of invitations where they might be able to show up and hawk their goods as part of a very expensive destination booth. What's your read on those types of events? Well, I think the fact that the New York Times show is no longer is, you know, is an indicator. And I think, you know, Pete mentioned that earlier in the, in the call, uh, I, I, the using those types of fares or to, to generate, you know, business on a B2C basis is, in my view, it's in terms of the time, the, the cost, the effort, the energy versus, frankly, hiring somebody like Chris and his team to up your digital game. <laughs> I wouldn't, I mean, I really wouldn't give it, you know, I wouldn't give it a thought. I mean, especially given all the shifts uh, in, uh, in, in the marketplace. Um, I, I think when I think of, I mean, I don't even really think of those events and I wouldn't recommend them. I think some of the big ones, they can be good for some of the larger organizations, more from a PR standpoint, or let's say if you're a travel agency, I know travel agencies will go to local trade fairs, but they're, they're going after locals, right? Who are, who are visiting. Uh, so my, my general sense is would be, you know, don't, you know, don't spend your, your time and money with, um, with, with any of those events and, you know, up your digital game. That's the biggest Pretty fair of all, frankly. <laughs> yeah. There, there is another way of attending events that is often under, and we've got another podcast coming up in this series that talks about it, which is representation. So if you're a really small operator and you're thinking about maybe something like WTM or uh, ITB, where there is business to be done, but you just cannot commit to that, there's organizations, specialist representation organizations that will represent you at these events for a much smaller fee and go on. Yeah. And, and the professionals have been doing it for a long time. They know how to build relationships. They know how to do the follow up. It's all a system life. But, but those are, that is B2B, right? That is, yeah. that is B2B. Yeah. And, and very often those representation firms, they will not just 
actually represent you at events, but they can they offer you know trade marketing services. They will actually support you with contracting, and I mean, so there's a whole range of services they provide. But that's uh, that's a great point, Pete. Yeah. Is there a world in which an operator should be looking at events outside of our industry? Um, on one level, I'm thinking on an educational level, participation in events like. I don't know, entrepreneurs organization or things that will just help you be a better business person, a better, a better entity, uh, no matter what you're, what you're doing. But I'm, I'm wondering if there's, there's any suggestions or thoughts around going outside of specifically travel or, or whatever it is in order to connect with an audience of some sort. I mean, of course, I mean, we're, we're here, you've got two event guys here talking about events so we built a business around events and yes it's in our industry but if i want to learn about you know how to do seo more effectively in sem uh i can take a course i can hire someone which is what we've done or if i really want to learn it i can go to an event and you know it's a search engine strategy so that's an actual company and go to their two-day event and dive in Right. And that's an investment in my time and money of whatever it costs. And I'll get an ROI if it really helps me learn SEO and SEM. So, of course, there's reasons to go to non industry events. Um, I bet it's a lot less common in our industry. Um, but I would never say no to going to events. I mean, that... no, we actually do that. I mean, for us at, at Arrival, I mean, we do that quite a, quite a bit. I mean, Bruce has attended events where we want to delve into a particular. Uh, topic or there's a particular segment of the market that we want to expand our our reach to, and those have been very, you know, very valuable. I think actually just, but even just stepping back, you know, for for a second, uh, I mean, it, it it ties into like the idea of education and inspiration, and you know, and Mitch, you brought up this word serendipity, which. Uh, in the context of events, often it's like, oh, I met that person you know, at the bar or we were passing each other up and down the stairs and we chatted and as a result, something happened. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's like a piece of it, but I, I actually think uh, there's a, a really important component or benefit to events that I think everyone should be thinking about is that you're you're going into an experience and very often, like especially as experienced business people and entrepreneurs, you know, you think you know everything about your business and you're really focused on what you want to do. And maybe you're going to go to an event and I want to meet this company and have this partnership or I want to up my game on SEO or this topic or that. But one of the things that I always say at the outset in our welcome, uh, our welcome session, especially for first first timers is you're here, like just, you might be an expert in your business, <clears throat> but just just let go of all of that and be open to uh, what may come at the event. I think in particular for us, because we're very much focused on education and professional development and covering trends and so forth. But I always say, you know, go to a session that you don't think you need to go to or go to a session that you think is totally irrelevant uh, for your business and be open to something that could really be transformational to your uh, to your business. I think it's it's the things that you you don't know that you don't know about your business, about your about your industry, about what the future, about about what may come and the opportunity is your, you know, at events, uh, whether it's arrival or elsewhere where you're surrounded by people who they've made the commitment like they're there they want to get something out of it. A lot of cases are not sure what, but sometimes those outcomes beyond the the person you meet or the contract, it's that little kernel of a, a piece of information or something that you see in the industry that's happening that makes you a little nervous that as a result, okay, shit, I'm going to go back to the office and change this and fire this person and do that. It's Sometimes it's those little things that can come out of an experience like that that can change your business forever. And I've got, I mean, there's, some stories that have come out of Arrival and from other events, uh, like we've got, there's just one operator in Italy that um, attended our first European event 
And I don't even remember this experience. This is something he told me where uh, apparently we drove, we got a, a, an Uber together to one of our parties after the conference and he introduced himself and, and he was telling me about his business. He did about 10,000 passengers a year. And I, you know, and just since we're always focused on tech and so forth, like, oh, it's like, well, you know, what OTAs do you work with? What booking system do you use? How does, and, and, and he's like, oh, I, I, I don't have a booking system. And I'm like, well, and then I just, what he told me is the expression on my face when uh, I heard him say that he does 10,000 passengers a year and doesn't have a booking system. Apparently, I had such an expression of disbelief and horror that as a result, he, the next day at the conference, he canceled all of his meetings and he went to every single booking system and did demos. And within two months, he was up and running on a booking system. Last year, he did 50,000 passengers a year. So I think those are the kinds of things that are possible when you come to an event uh, and you just let yourself be open to what you don't know, you don't know, and the possibilities that are going to be in front of you, because this industry is so incredible and so diverse and the, the people that you meet are so amazing. Uh, so that's, I have one piece of advice, no matter what event you attend to is, just come in and leave all of the things you think you know, like to the side and just be open for anything and everything. I love that idea of going to something that makes no sense to you or doesn't seem relevant. Not maybe filling your schedule with that. To, to, to the point of my original question, I had in mind also not just education, but the level of asking yourself, where is your potential partner meeting? Uh, they're not necessarily going to a travel conference in order to meet with travel people. I think of, uh, for example, a tour guide that I used to know in Washington, D.C., who a long time ago recognized that there was an, uh, a local conference of all of the Washington, D.C. hotel concierges in, uh, uh, in a ballroom. She showed up as a tour guide and just stood there with her business card and met people out in the lobby. And she's, and she's like, I, I, I cleaned house. Uh, with relationships with concierge, because everyone else was doing hand-to-hand, door-to-door combat. I think of uh, people in the student youth segment. Doug, I saw you at um, CITA this year, the Student Youth Travel Association. Well, um, in addition to that, if you're a tour operator and you're selling performance group travel, uh, go to music educator conferences where teachers are hanging out. There's There's a side of these events where you can be the odd duck, but actually there uh, stand out in a way that um, allows you to make connections with actual customers too. So I think there's a whole gamut of opportunity out there in events. Well, there are the what's being identified very clearly two sides of every event. There is the education, the content that gives you inspiration and challenges your way of thinking as you move forward into this industry. And, you know, at arrival, that is a huge part of our event. And then there is the B2B, the business buying and selling, meeting potential partners and that whole side, which is, I think, what we've spent a lot of our time talking about today is how to make deals and meet people and all that piece. Um, And again, at arrival, we kind of match both of them together, make sure there's opportunities for you to decide what you want to do with those. But most events are on the second side, the B2B connection side, you know, your concierge example. I'm going to guess there wasn't a lot of education there of how to be a concierge. It was, you know, you tell me, maybe I'm wrong, but most events are kind of that B2B network exchange, sign contracts, if they're doing contracts. Um, and if that's what you need, if you need more suppliers, distributors, et cetera, then go to those. There, there's also the advantage. I found events in the early days opened my eyes to, I was running a venture company in Scotland and I was following and developing experiences similar to other operators in Scotland. But once you start working, going to events and meeting operators from the US and meeting operators in South America and Asia, we are doing very similar experience to you, but in a very different way. So there's a whole product de- development learning process as events as well. I mean, I, I changed a lot of products based on what I learned at events by meeting other operators, seeing how they were doing it, learning from them, taking away the idea and going and going and put it in my business. And that's a sort of often missed thing. 
but it is hugely, hugely valuable. It just shortens that whole learning process on your product development uh, learning journey. Yep, I well, peer to peer learning, which if we haven't really made enough clarity on that, that is the key to good events is peer to peer learning. Learn from each other. When you're at an event, you know, like an arrival where everyone in that room is in the experiences industry, that you just learn from each other. So it's it's peer to peer learning is what you're talking about, Peter, and and that is what is so and it's pretty about coming to the right events. Sure. So let's talk for let's talk about arrival. Once again, interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> no, at Peter's freaking beach house Wi-Fi, if he could get back to his home in Scotland eventually. <laughs> so right. in, on, when you're also looking through who's attending, say you're a, a psycho operator, make sure you reach out to all the other psycho operators that you've never met before. You know, see other psycho operators there? Just to clarify, you're saying... Psycho. If you go to the event, I go to the psycho. The psycho thing happens as well, but the psycho. Psycho. Psycho, <laughs> psycho is already in operator. Yeah. But the by psycho, make sure you don't treat to the vertical when you're in, because there's going to be maybe ten, maybe fifteen, maybe twenty. You've been to events where there's an event happening in the evening, and there's fifty bike operators attending a mini event within an event. So make sure you reach out. This is not the buying and selling necessarily. It's just connect with people who's in your niche within your community because then connections will last with you for life. But just, I, you know, on the flip side, go to the other thing, you know, I mean, also purposefully reach out, especially in this industry. Like if you do a, if you do a food tour, reach out to a cycling operator. If you're a cycling operator, find a boat. I, I mean, there is like connect with people who are a little bit outside of your world too, and or go to a session again that's maybe not directly relevant to your business, or so it would seem. And I just I would really I think that is often uh, it's it's not talked about the opportunity to. And to learn from other, you know, other quarters within our industry and things that are things that maybe other groups are are doing, uh, where you can kind of learn from uh, from from some of the things that they're trying there. I think that's that's really important. Yes, to connect with folks that are in your niche, and you can talk about the ins and outs of uh, you know of the best <laughs> latest trends and bikes, or like go to the water sports forum at the Awkward Water Sports uh, podcast guys, you know, have organized. And you go into detail about there was I was down at the last one, the big discussion between like Yamaha and another type of jet ski. I can't remember and some of the parts issues and all of that. And that's also great. But I think like, for example, there's a lot that I that I know that they could learn from, say, a lot of the walking tours that, you know, spend a lot of time with Mitch, for example, on experience design, little things like creating those kind of peak experiences, how you welcome guests, how you see them off, how you. All of those things are really important. There's lots of cross-learning opportunities that can happen across different segments of the industry. Plus, adding on to that, other operators in your specific market might actually be partners, not competition, but the opportunity to create affiliate relationships, mm -hmm. cross-sells. I just We just had an operator um, on our last huddle, little meeting, and um, she talked about how she formed a collective of different operators offering a variety of complementary experiences so you don't have to grow through reinventing the wheel. Just to finish off here, Bruce, can you give us the rundown of how to decipher the variety of arrival events that you have on display across the world? Sure. Thanks, Mitch. I mean, now that we're back doing in-person events again, which we started around uh, in February 2022, we're back on our cycle of one event a year starting off in Berlin right before ITB in March. And then we head over to Bangkok in June when it's pretty much as hot uh, and humid as it possibly can be. And then we come back to, for our US event, which will be in October going forward. Um, and we'll be in Orlando this year uh, in mid-March. So that's the three event cycle that represent our primary key events. There are others that we co-locate with, 
and and do some other things with, which change every year. But those three are are really what the arrival rep event structure is. So you're saying you choose horrible weather moments to keep everyone captive in the ballroom? Not purposefully. Um, and certainly Berlin in March is not ideal, um, but being together with ITV is, right? Um, or Chris is going to bring his new bathing suit to Berlin in March, right? And <laughs> <laughs> What do you smoke a little bit? Uh, the, cocktail, the cocktail party said, wear a suit. <laughs> You know, there's another piece to that, really, though, which, you know, let's just look at the U.S. And uh, there, you were talking about an event in Vegas. And I'm sitting here. I, I know that our attendees are like, why do you guys go to Vegas and Orlando every year? Well, because those are the two cheapest places to have an event, especially Vegas. Um, I mean, Vegas, our last event, we had $109. Well, let me, just be, let me clarify, though. It's so not necessarily cheap for us, right? But it's... We, we try to find, like we know that because there are a lot of small to medium sized businesses. And so we prioritize finding destinations where there's really affordable airfares and, and hotel rooms because, you know, we also have to charge for our event because of all the things that we do. So, uh, uh, yeah, but not cheap for us. <laughs> no, I mean, every event pretty much has the same cost. So yeah. Pay, yeah. But the room rate in Vegas was 109, right? The room rate in Orlando, which is pretty much the second least expensive event town is like $200 a night. So we've already jumped to that. San Diego is going to be $250. Um, if you want to go back to Vegas every year, that will be able to allow our room rate to stay under $150 for a long time. Um, we've been hearing people are like, let's just skip Vegas. Uh, we can't go there every year. But, um, but Bruce, so just like, I think a key, like for us, the reason why we have events in three different regions is because, uh, well, there's two key reasons. I mean, one is... Uh, uh, to the point that Pete had brought up earlier, just, you know, the expense, right, of, of travel is, it, and especially for a lot of small um, operators, is it's a serious one. And so we know that to really have an impact, we have to bring arrival to the region and make arrival, you know, more accessible. But also just, you know, the issues and the topics are so different from region to region, I mean, even country to country to a degree. So, you know, in Europe, you know, we're focused on topics that are, uh, are top of mind to operators uh, based in uh, in Europe, and the vast majority of our speakers are European. And likewise for the uh, Asia Pacific event in Bangkok, very focused on topics that are really relevant to the Asia market. Um, and same thing for North America. I loved the Las Vegas event because no windows anywhere you looked in the casino meant I think I stayed up for about 130 hours straight networking. So it was wonderful. <laughs> and I, you can't, um, you can't include your, uh, your losses at the casino as part of uh, your cost for arrival. I just want to say, oh, all expenses, <laughs> exactly, exactly, tax write off. Arrival right, um, not responsible for that. So. <laughs> so we have come to the departure of our podcast. Douglas, would you have any final words of wisdom about the event industry, about for for our tourpreneurs, just to um just to leave with a leave with a nugget? Uh, it, keep listening to tourpreneur, uh, and uh, it, and just you know be open and always learning. I think as you guys you know always say, I mean that's there's always something new. I always learn so much at our events. I learned so much from the work that all of you do and, and your podcast, and there's so much that's changing so quickly. So just, uh, yeah, don't become curmudgeon like Pete and just keep an open mind to everything and keep learning and pushing forward. This whole podcast was one big, one big kind of wake up call, I think, for our operators to not become like Pete. But <laughs> you, you, you say keep listening to Entrepreneur. We say keep attending Arrival. I think the three of us can absolutely say it is our favorite events of the year. Mm -hmm. The parties, the no. networking lounge. The, the the word serendipity for me is everything. You create a central space where everybody just crosses paths. So many couches, so many open bars that you can't leave without new partnerships. And as long as you can remember which ones they were, you'll have a great time. So... We successfully navigated a conversation in which all five of us are used to being the question asker and the moderator. And uh, I want to say, Bruce and Douglas, thank you for kicking off our series on events. We appreciate it. Thanks so much for having us. It's awesome. Great to be back on Torpreneur. Thanks, guys.